Welcome back to the Marcus Milioni podcast. Today we brought Sean along with us because we are going to be discussing just general wellness, fitness, kind of our journey, what we've learned, nutrition, and uh, now more running than anything because we have really ratcheted up our training. Um, We were doing about 20 to 25 miles per week. for the last, I don't know, what was it, three months or so, we were doing like a base building plan. And against all advice, we jumped right into a 46 uh, mile a week plan. Uh, it's part of uh, Fitzinger's book, Faster Road Racing. It'll get us all the way up to 63 miles um, per week, but I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, we'll, we'll bring it all the way back to the beginning of our wellness slash fitness journey, I guess. Um, Sean and I both played high school sports. Um, it was, it was a decision we both made to kind of specialize in lacrosse in the beginning. Um, and I decided very early on, I wanted to play division one. I, I don't, I won't speak for you, but I don't think you decided until later yeah, I um, I had some back and forth uh, about if I wanted that time commitment. I knew how much work it was. So I was kind of up in the air until probably the end of my junior year when I committed and I, I said, all right, let's go for it. Probably a little earlier than that, right? Because uh, when did you commit? I committed late. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Was, like a pretty late commit. Yeah, because I, I remember we would go to this coach. We called him Coach Trigg, um, and he was a really, really, really good lacrosse coach, and we would have these lessons with him. And one, first off, Sean and I, in the beginning, we hated these lessons. This guy was the hardest coach I've ever played under, and in, like, the best way possible. He rode the people that went to him so hard because he knew – how to get out of you what he needed or what you needed to take it to the next level. And for the first, I would say, maybe year of going to him, we dreaded those lessons. It was horrible. One, because you don't get to work on any of the stuff you're actually decent at. He made you do the most uncomfortable stuff to make you an overall, just more well-rounded player. And these lessons were terrible. So Sean and I started going and then... I had decided I wanted to go to Vision One. Sean hadn't yet, so he stopped coming to Trig with me for. I would say probably a year. I picked up a job, which I talked about <laughs> on the other podcast. Um, probably six months or to a year, I, I stopped going. Um, yeah. I just lacrosse was a little bit stale to me, and I didn't feel like putting in those extra hours. And I knew, you know, you definitely, if you're not feeling it, you don't want to go to this coach because. He's brutal. He breaks you down. Um, but you know, overall, like he's trying to help you. And I didn't really realize until later, but this guy is like an artist by trade. Like he's an extremely <coughs> talented painter. And I think that's kind of part of why he can break you down so well is he notices all of the small details in extremely good players and how to translate that over to younger players who have not developed the skill set in maybe their offhand or just the way they're going about seeing the field. And so he would be able to break it down into steps of you need to practice X, Y, and Z, and then we'll throw it all together. And then you can start to actually practice the full movement. And then it goes full movement into movement with while making decisions. And then you just tie it all together. And at the end of it, you become a pretty good player. He's extremely good coach. I think generally it's great because it's a huge ego check. You know, you you think you're good enough to go division one. You think you're uh, good enough to play at the next level. And then you go to a coach who's coached, you know, top talent from across the country. And literally totally everything you thought you knew, he tells you it's not correct. You should be doing it a different way. And you trust him because he coaches the best players. So, you know, the only way to really succeed with a coach like that is to leave your ego at the door and, you know, try to learn. He knows what's best for you. Um, so soak it all up. Yeah. I, I think he, he taught me a couple just life lessons in general. Like you got to work on your weaknesses. Like for me being a dominant right hand player, like I had to get a left hand if I wanted to, you know, 
exceed or do anything at the next level. So that was a big, I remember us both <laughs> just trying to work on that, like with him. It was so brutal. I hated it in high school and into college. Like I continued working with this guy all the way till my junior year of college, and it we continued to refine it. But um, yeah, work on your weaknesses. You have to put the time in on your own, or you're just not going to get. You can't go to one lesson for an hour during the week and then that be it. You have to hammer that shit so the next time you come back you can work on something else so you can take the next step. He mm -hmm. can't be like re, he would get so mad if he had to rehash the stuff that you went over at the last lesson and not in a way of like, you can ask him to rehash it, but if he know if he can tell you didn't put in the time between that, the like six days where you haven't worked together, then I mean, you're in for an earful. For yeah, sure. You just didn't want to show up. You would, ra <laughs> you would rather just wait it out and hope, hope he forgets, but yeah. he, he wouldn't. So that, that kind of brings us into our training. Uh, we started in the gym. I think I was around 16 years old. Started with a performance <laughs> coach uh, who Sean and I both went to. He owned kind of a sports performance gym near where we lived, uh, and he always had trained athletes um, so we went there early and that was our first experience in the gym before then I'd never lifted weights ever in my life. I don't think mm -mm. besides some pushups in the room and, you know, just general exercise outside with friends, we never touched a weight. Yeah. And this kind of lifting was not bodybuilding. Like we were not there. We were going to put on size just cause we were coming into puberty and like, that's just, it was gonna, a bit of size was going to happen just because we were lifting weights but we are very much so training to be athletes, injury prevention, um, like very dynamic movements and just strengthening a lot of the smaller muscles just to support those movements. And I actually, I credit him with keeping us extremely healthy during our careers. Like none of us had any knee problems or anything like besides like a couple pulled hamstrings or stuff like that, or like, you know, shoulder issues, we were fine. Yeah. But that was mostly our fault. I mean, you know, we knew what to do, but sometimes you're so busy, you just forget to do it. Like stretching. Yeah. Yeah. Still bad about that. I think the good thing about, you know, going to this place was he knew we were training for sport. He knew we were training for lacrosse. So he taught us movements that would translate well into the game. Um, lacrosse isn't like a cardio base like it is running, really. I mean, it's short bursts. And if you're a midfielder, you know, you have to be able to go up and down the field two or three times but it you're not running you know crazy amounts like you're you only need to be good in short bursts yeah so we're yeah we were very much training those fast twitch muscle fibers um whereas now you know endurance running is not fast twitch at all <laughs> yeah. it's very like straight line not a lot of lateral movements and you're just going, you know, long periods of time. So you're, the muscle, it's like more slow twitch muscle fiber. But we were just, yeah, I mean, we, we trained fast twitch all through college. I didn't, I hated running. Yeah, I mean, which is why I think we, we didn't like it in the beginning. We didn't understand the process of building up those slow t twitch muscles. Uh, we were used to, you know, these explosive movements. You know, we weren't very good at running because we hadn't done it y the way you're supposed to. Um, and if you haven't done anything and you're not good at it, you probably won't like it. So, yeah, I mean, for as far as like conditioning went, I know our school had a two mile and under 12 minutes test, which I failed every single year, never passed it. Um, I can pass it now, which is funny, but like completely different use. And we both had a thing called 300s, which were 50 yard for us. It was 50 yard increments down back, down back, down back. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing about those 300s is usually these conditioning and the conditioning slash tests happen in the winter. So not only are you battling your legs, just, you know, hitting like a lactic threshold immediately, but your lungs are burning because the air is freezing cold. And it's generally early morning when you're getting those, those um, conditioning set conditioning sessions in but that's what we trained for like in the summer sean and i would hammer out 300s all the time mm -hmm. and that that was our form of cardio it was very high intensity sprint work yep 
I mean, I'm sure a bunch of people who listen know about the beep test. You had that in like gym classes. I know I, I had it in gym class. Uh, so really it was focusing on the, that short burst and then w- like stopping at the line and getting out to, to get back mm-hmm. um, instead of just going in a straight line like running is. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Your, your transition out of your turns was going to make a break if you got your times or not, exactly. essentially. And a lot of people didn't understand that. They're like They would just kind of do the U-shaped turn. Like, you got to get in and out on, like, a V and cover, cover that ground fast. But even then, like, the, the two-mile test, I, I, I thought that was distance running. Went out back when I was in school. I remember thinking in my head, like, this is distance. This makes no sense because... We are fast twitch. We're trying to build fast twitch muscle fiber when in reality, like two miles is not far at all. Mm-mm. I remember my coach was like, <laughs> yeah, um, on the weekends, like after games, he'd be like, don't just sit around, go and like run a mile. Um, and back then I was like, oh, a mile, like yeah, that seems so long. Um, and it was, and it was, it, it was brutal, but it's just funny looking at the comparison between the two. What were those shoes you were running those miles in with the bubbles on the bottom? Oh, uh, the Vapor Maxes or something. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I knew nothing about running. Like, I, I was wear- or I was running in shoes that probably were just destroying my ankles, my foot. Uh, it w- it was bad. So no wonder I didn't enjoy it. Nike Vapor Maxes. If you're if you're on the computer r- listening to this, look it up. Yeah, I think because those they are them. they're just th- they're definitely not running shoes. I, I think Nike advertised them as running shoes in the beginning, and then they switched them to lifestyle shoes. So probably when sure. people were getting injured. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, when, when, when we were younger, did we like training? Uh, I don't really know. I, m- I remember pushing back on my dad about just getting in the gym in general because it was new to me and it was foreign to me. And obviously, you know, when you're 16 years old and you're like kind of awkward, shy, you don't want to go put yourself in a gym and be like uh, this little weak guy. Like I remember I was getting trained by one of their trainers and she, uh, was a woman. She played what did she play? Soccer, Kyle? Uh, uh, no, she played basketball. Basketball. She was so athletic. It was insane how fast she was. And she, like, up until I was in college, like, made fun of me because I was in there, like, using the 20-pound dumbbells on, like, <laughs> bench press and stuff just because I was so weak when I came in. So, And she s- essentially saw our entire transformation of, like, getting bigger and stronger and faster over the years. She was a she was one of our like main trainers almost. It was interesting because you would do we would, we did group classes uh, sprinkled in. We had some like private sessions, but you do these group classes and and you're kind of with the same people uh, through the years. So it it was interesting to see how in the beginning I was like so slow I I couldn't you know beat anybody in a, a race. We would do like. 30 yard sprints and I would always be last. And then like, as years went on, I kept working out it. I kept growing into my body. I obviously hit puberty, you know, seeing the progress I think helped in the journey of like going to the gym more often, because once you see that progress, then it becomes addicting. I remember being so frustrated. Well, I, I, I was late bloomer on puberty, but like by <coughs> far, and it, and that was before I really understood what puberty was. Like you get in this like rush of test essentially, to enhance your performance and like there was obviously the kids who hit it super early and they were always more athletic because mm-hmm. they're literally have a ton more tests than just people who haven't and they're more developed and I remember like hitting it late and like always being so mad about it and then I kind of like realized that it was a blessing in disguise because I was always playing catch up like I always had to work so much harder than everybody else just to make up for that like late bloomer whatever mm-hmm. you know um this kind of starts around uh around this time like us going into college so we, we, we've been training through high school with um at that like performance gym and we go into college now we've had a bit of we started to understand nutrition and why it was important while while we were in high school not as much so as we do now but like the performance coach understood the nutrition and and it was like very basic stuff like you got to have your protein after the gym and make sure you're hitting protein outside of that kind of just ate whatever because we were growing so fast that we could just mow down calories and it did not matter at all 
And at this point, we were we were both pretty heavily invested into the gym. Um, we both enjoyed going. We would go every day. So, like, we were obsessed with the gym, and then it was kind of this next step of, like, okay, I see all this about nutrition, and I don't really do anything other than eat whatever I, I want. So how could this, if, you, if I get my nutrition right, how could this transform me even more? Yeah, keep in mind that, like, during this time, our favorite lifts are – single leg Bulgarian split squats and hang cleans. And it was like a race to see who could put up the most weight on those lifts. Which, <laughs> I mean, it was it was fun, but looking back on it, it was just kind of crazy how... I mean, we'd go in once a week and try to max. I think I would do them every day. I would work out. We'd have our regular scheduled workouts. And then afterwards, I would go by myself and just try to lift as heavy as possible which is just so bad i was giving my muscles no time to recover so it was no wonder that you know i I never really hit those numbers that i wanted to hit yeah i mean milestones were like 225 for the first time 245 (laughs) for the first time and then like bulgarian split squats were just like what we did we did not squat really yeah I, i i really did single leg movements up until i had to go into college and you know, our strength coach there, you know, you get tested on the, in the squat, the deadlift, the bench, you know, pull-ups, all that stuff. So I had to, had to figure that out, but it's, it's pretty much, it's the same movement essentially, but it's really different. Um, you know, I, I thought I would be able to lift, you know, a, a bunch of weight on my squat, but I couldn't because I had never done it. So if you don't practice yeah. it, you're not, you know, you're not going to get it. Yeah. I remember I could, I could Bulgarian split squat 280 pounds and couldn't squat 225 because I just, I'd never squat. Like I'd never put that, like that movement wasn't part of our training ever really. Which was frustrating because, you know, you don't understand why it doesn't translate and you see all these people who have been training squatting um, crush their numbers and then you haven't. And especially as a freshman, there's a lot of pressure to, you know, put up numbers so the coaches, you know, at least see it. Yeah, because that kind of is the first thing you test before you get on the field. So it's like, I need to make a first impression now because (laughs) so if you have like a good lift, which for Sean and I was always hang clean, like I knew going into college that I I didn't actually know that I would have, you know, one of the better hang cleans, but I knew that I was extremely strong at the lift and I had really good form. So like that was both working like in the positive direction for me. It was also funny to see kids that had never hand cleaned once in their life, like do it on test day. And it was, <laughs> it was so bad. Like the form was so bad. <laughs> yeah, I know. And then they were probably thinking the same thing when we were squatting is like, have these kids never squat? It's yeah. I mean, it wasn't that our form was bad. It's just, we couldn't do any weight. Yeah. No, yeah. I always made sure my form was good. I just, for some reason I could, I could never get out of the hole. Um, yeah. I had, I had no problem if I got out of the hole. It's just, I, I didn't practice it enough. So we start to focus on nutrition. Freshman and sophomore year for me in college, couldn't really do much. Like you're on the meal plan uh, at the dining hall. So I knew to pick like protein and vegetables, but your your options are limited. Sometimes it was like the only chicken or protein that I had available was like one of those fried chicken patty things that you get from the mess hall. So I, and and at this time, we're still like blowing through calories. We're you know, training in the gym and then training on the field. So it was like three hours of work a day. So it didn't really matter what I was eating. I just needed fuel. Um, but I had, I had started to understand like protein, fats, carbs, just the general macro stuff as I had kind of started to become more invested in how do I elevate performance a little bit more. And it was really all through Google. I think Marcus and I learned everything through Google and, you know, talking to some people who were more experienced. But you you look up a bunch of stuff on, on Google, you, you can usually find an answer and there's a ton of different sources. Um, and so read all of them, you know, compare what they're saying. And that's kind of how we learned about it. Yeah, uh, that brings us to our uh, our first cut ever in 2017 it was me, Sean and Tyler Cliggett. <laughs> Uh, who is one of my best friends, you know, we consider him a brother and we like got full blown invested in getting as shredded, (laughs) as shredded as possible. And so it was like this low snowball of like us all 
trying to learn as much information as possible on like <laughs> daily energy expenditure, what is my base calories, like how many calories am I eating and how many, how am I going to estimate how many I'm burning at practice? Um, and it was the first time ever in my life I started tracking my food mm -hmm. in my fitness pal. Yeah. I used to wear a heart rate monitor just to like, it, it got to the point where it probably wasn't healthy. I mean, the, the, what we were doing because we became so obsessed with it, but it was fun because we all had each other. We all could like joke around about being so hungry. We all could joke <laughs> yeah. around about like, oh no, I just binge ate, um, you know, some stuff late at night, you know. It was never like make or break us. Yeah, I remember my one coach like mm -hmm. actually not being happy with me when I showed up to practice in March. It was like 90 degrees and I was in full sweats because I was I was trying to burn as many calories as possible. And I don't even know if that's effective at all. It's just going to make me sweat more. But in my head, I was like, all right, I'm just rolling out there in full sweats. So I just showed up to practice in full sweats. And, uh, yeah, was not happy about that. He was like, what are you doing? And I'm just like, I'm just, by this point, I'm like kind of checked out. I'm, and I don't know, I played well, like, I don't, it doesn't matter yeah, if I'm I mean, in full sweats or not. As long as I play well, who cares? It was the summer. I think you were the only one out there. Um, so he was, <laughs> he was probably just upset about that. He knew you were just losing so much water and, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was fun and we got a little crazy with it, but I think that was the first step into kind of learning more and more each year about nutrition. Yeah. I, we did take it to an extreme and I would say that that is a con because once you go that extreme, it can be hard to walk yourself back and realize that like you can't live your life at 5% body fat. Like you, everything starts to break down. Your joints hurt, your like everything is gone. Like your test will start to go to crash. Your sleep will turn to like terrible mm -hmm. and to you then have to learn to walk yourself backwards like okay i can go and start eating more without binge eating because i've been so restrictive and i can go into an quote unquote off season to put on or kind of like recomp put on some size get my lifts back um and that that's what i would say is a con like once you hit that level mentally <clears throat> it can be hard to learn to to go back yeah, because you see how, you know, good, in, in air quotes, you look, and and you always want to look that good. But if you stay that way as long as, you know, we wanted to, you're not gaining any muscle. Your, your body's not getting the nutrients it needs. And then eventually you're going to start looking a little bit, like, sick. Yeah. Um, but on the pro side of that first cut in 2017, we really did learn how to track our food, what foods – where like worked with our bodies you know mm -hmm. each each of us are different so you know we all kind of figured out our diets and and what worked and what didn't um but it was very rudimentary and we were still learning a lot as we were going you know there were takeaways that we would apply to next year that we wouldn't do again or something like that you know i think one of the biggest things you know and one of the best things we learned was that the ingredients and like how many calories are in like a handful of nuts or or stuff like that like things that are labeled as healthy they don't they to, aren't necessarily to the general population yeah they aren't necessarily healthy and so i learned you know after tracking and doing all of this i was like what i thought was healthy before i did you know started this journey i, I realized wasn't like there's a ton of additives there's a ton of you know terrible like fats in there sucralose all of that stuff it's just you have to be careful and you know marketing is crazy these days these companies pay so much money to market their products and you know make people believe that they're healthy yeah i mean you can't sit down and eat a, a half a bag of mixed nuts like there goes 900 calories mm -hmm. on the day and you know how easy it is to get one of those those mixed nut bags and like if you're if you're just a desk job worker and you're not going to the gym and you're not burning any calories like that's om that's almost half of your daily energy expenditure right there in like a bag of nuts or something that you bring to your desk that you just snack on while you're working that was one of the biggest eye-opening things for me while i when i went 
or when I went through that. Yeah, because I mean, I was always like, oh, nuts are healthy. Like they, you know, they're from nature. They're 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 just nothing's in them. It's just a nut. Um, but then you look at the serving sizes, and then you look at the calories, and then you look at all of that, and that's how you you know you learn. But you can also get in trouble if you don't if you don't really pay attention to it. Yeah. And another thing I learned like during the entire time is being able to just eat repetitively and may not not make it be a chore. Uh, I think in the bodybuilding community, there's a, there's that me there's kind of like a meme of chicken rice broccoli. It doesn't have to be bland chicken rice and broccoli. You can make your meals something that you enjoy eating. You know, every day. Sean and I eat pretty much the same meals for lunch and dinner every day. And not only is it one le couple less decisions that we have to make a week, but we know we're getting the nutrients that we need. Plus it doesn't taste bad. I still look forward to it every single day. And I don't want to, I don't want to be having to figure out what to cook every day. I have no desire to do that. Yeah. I think, you know, we, people, you know, see Marx's day in the life where he like cooks food and they're always like, why do you never switch it up? Why all of that stuff? But I mean, that's all we know and we know it's good for our bodies like we've been doing it for so long that we we feel good when we eat it i think one of the worst things that we can feel is you eat something and you just feel terrible you feel lethargic you're just at your desk and you're just like falling asleep and i mean i don't think anybody likes that but we try to avoid that as much as possible especially now that we're running so much you know I wake up in the morning and if I ate bad the day before, like my run's going to be worse. So I have to keep all that in mind. Uh, but that's also to say like we do enjoy, you know, some treats here and there. It's not like we're robots and we just literally eat the same thing. 80% of the time. If you do what you're supposed to do, and this goes for anything, diet, <coughs> fitness, work. If you do what you're supposed to do and you do it well 80% of the time, the other 20% don't really matter. You know, like 80% yeah. of your effort brings the majority of your um, results. Mm -hmm. So understand. Also, it, it forced me to learn how to cook because like I had to make I had to make these ingredients, which if you just ate bland, were going to be bad and you were never going to stick to your diet. So you just you have to figure out how to make them taste better. For you, that's just adding a sauce. <laughs> <laughs> I just put hot sauce or salt or pepper or something. I'm not a cook, but I still don't mind it. It's like, gotten better. It's good. <laughs> um, setbacks while training. So injuries, which I touched on a little bit. We, we were very fortunate to be pretty injury-free for playing uh, sports all four years of college and growing up, you know, and our whole lives. And yeah, youth league and all of that. I still have a left torn uh, torn labrum in my left shoulder. It's um, been this way since I think sophomore year of college. Um, I don't have any plans on getting it repaired. I know you had surgery on your sur on your shoulder. I think yeah. I think is yours a half tear? It's a partial tear. Yeah, yeah. mine tore all the way through, so I had to get surgery on it because it, my uh, shoulder would fall out of its socket, which is not fun. Um, general like tightness hamstrings or you were you were pulling your hamstrings a lot there for a little bit yeah i what, went through junior this, year i think junior year or senior year, i can't remember i went through this period where uh i pulled my hamstring once and like when i talk about pull like the back of my leg was completely black and blue like so i pulled it bad and hamstrings, I learned through that process, are it, they're one of those things where, like, if you don't give them adequate amount of time to recover, you will pull it again. And every time you feel good, you can walk and jog perfectly fine. It's just that one explosive movement that will re-pull it. And so I ended up, like, pulling it two or three more times because I would come back too early. Um, so that was kind of the first time I really was like, okay, your body needs to recover. You need to give it adequate time to recover or you're just putting yourself back more. Like you can't just ego your way through it and just think you're stronger than your muscle is. Yeah, and, and around that same time Sean was dealing with the hamstring stuff, I was having really bad back issues, like back, not even like pain. I don't even know how to describe it. Like it got so bad that I went for a jump shot using my left hand in practice and my entire left leg went asleep while I was in midair like after I had launched off the ground and like torqued my back to shoot 
my entire left leg went numb and I like fell. And then there was a period of a couple weeks where we were doing like stim trigger point therapy to try to get this to release. And then after it wasn't really working, I started to read online like I always do. I would try to take in as much information as I can. And I had come across an article talking about hamstring tightness and how it, it really affects your back, like in all regions of your back, but specifically lower back. And it was talking about tightness and that. And so I was like, well, well maybe I just have a really tight hamstrings. So I started hammering 30 minutes of stretching every single day because I couldn't practice at the time. I was like out of practice. Started hammering 30 minutes of stretching every day uh, before the team went out for practice and I was just like kind of standing on the sideline and it eventually unlocked. But I, I have noticed ever since that anytime I have any sort of back tightness or back pain, it's probably because my hamstrings are tight. And I don't think enough people talk about back pain being associated with tight hamstrings. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting too because I feel like Marcus's most common injuries are like his lower back and his back. And my most common injuries, I always have sore hamstrings. I always am dealing with hamstring tightness. Um, so you wonder if like those events and like all of that wear and tear on him and where we didn't know how to treat it correctly is a result of it. Yeah. I mean, even now, like with your, you're starting to get some like knee twinges could a hundred percent be related to your <coughs> hamstrings. Yeah. According to Google, there could be a hamstring correlation, but still need to look into it. <laughs> um, Knowing when to rest is also like a, hu a huge thing we're, and we're terrible at it and we've always been really bad at it. We built in like a regimen for so long of just going all the time. But even as we get older, like taking proper rest days is going to be something we have to continue to work on. Like it, tomorrow we're off running, but I know we're going to go to the gym. And today we have, we just ran 11 miles and I know we're going to go, we have to hit legs after this. I think like probably not optimal at all. I think it's definitely something we're getting better at, especially as we run more and read more about recovery. But I think both of us, you know, I was mentally not let myself miss a day in the gym in college. And even uh, after college, like I would have to go to the gym. I would have to do some sort of lift for some reason, like in my head, <clears throat> it just made sense. I thought I was going to lose muscle. Um, but now we're, we're learning like, I need a rest day. I do not want to go to the gym because I'm putting this mileage in and I'm tired. Like my knees hurt. I need to rest then. Yeah. I, and also it just circles back to constantly learning. Like no, our process isn't the most efficient, but we're always trying to learn what is most optimal. And if we can't do what's most optimal, obviously if you want to be, a fast long distance runner being this heavy isn't optimal training and lifting heavy isn't optimal but we're doing it anyway because it's something we enjoy and fitness in general should be something that you enjoy so why take out the things you enjoy and try to why not try to marry the two even if it's less optimal just try to be good at both um but this this takes us to running and kind of where we're at now like I said at the beginning of the podcast, uh, we have really ratcheted up the running. The running now has is something I, if you had asked me four years ago if I could run forty to sixty three miles a week, I would have told you you are insane. That will never happen. Like it's not even possible. I can't even run two miles. I think both Marcus and I have have said in our lives that like we will after college we're not going to run we're not going to do it like we've had yeah. enough um but i think that's you know the result of you know running in college is totally different than running on your own terms plus you go from an environment where you have competition every single day in practice and it's like i think we're both extremely competitive people and so like you graduate and then where is the competition like you can go to the gym and i guess work on your numbers like yeah okay that is competition it's kind of similar competition to running and then you start to try things like running and you do your first race and you're like holy shit like i could start training harder for this and become a faster runner or be more respected in like ge the general running community if i have faster times so 
why not try to do that too on top of lifting so like there's the competitive side of it's now you versus you or you versus this clock like i remember when we timed our first 5k ever like now that 1826 or 1824 that i ran is ingrained in my head like i know the next time i go out to run it i have to run sub 18 mm-hmm. i think it's the first time in our life where we've really transitioned from something other than lifting where we're trying to you know obviously we're still in the gym every day or, or five days out of the week uh we're trying to incre- or improve our lifts but we're not like trying to get we're not trying to improve our numbers the way we used to like we're mm-hmm. mainly focused on running we have this or i have the the new york city half that i'm training for marks is probably going to do a race um so it's just a whole switch up and we're getting used to it yeah i, I mean the, the, what the mileage we're running now we're only on week two generally you know we're feeling pretty good but this mileage is <coughs> is tough um on a, like a seasoned runner this is not much for them but for, for people coming off of 20 miles a week it's a lot um and it also is kind of the reason why i'm not i'm hesitant to do a full marathon because i know i'd essentially have to double this mileage if this is how we're training for a half marathon how the hell are we going to train for a full marathon this is using up a lot of time well i think as we increase our base and uh, you know we get faster i don't know hopefully we could train for a marathon and not do a 100 mile weeks hopefully yeah i mean we have to do at least 70 mile weeks have to if you want to run a sub three you kind of yeah you got to push those miles up but it brings us back to just how we were training in the beginning (laughs) how we were training when we started like sean and i used to think uh and it probably goes back to just sports and sprinting in general like every run that you went out on when we used to do a mile warm-up or two mile warm-up for the gym had to be fast like you had to always be running it faster than the last time you ran it, which if you think about it, how stupid of like logic is that? It's not possible to just always go out and just run a faster time than you ran the day before because now you have compounding like breaking down of your muscles and fatigue in general. But that's how, that's how we ran. Yeah, I think it all comes down to just lack of research. We, we just did not know enough about running to really – train the way we were supposed to train i mean going into the san diego half we didn't train right i my my san diego half plan was running like three miles every day at like whatever pace i was kind of feeling <laughs> if i was feeling good i'd ride, run it faster if i was sore i'd run it a little all bit on a treadmill and then one long run and sometimes ridiculously long like i would do you know maybe a six to eight miles on sunday and then you know next weekend i would do like try to do 18 miles <laughs> it, it made absolutely no sense um so it's no wonder I, I i failed my goal yeah i mean another like big stupid thing that we were doing is we were just doing all of these i mean I, it's not even all of these miles but like a majority of our block of miles was on a treadmill no like outdoors no wind resistance and no hills like you have you have to incorporate hills into your work, into Which is your hard legs. hard in New York, but luckily Central Park has some. Yeah, Cent- Central Park has some hills, and, like, if you really, really – if you're in New York City and you really, really need to run, like, hill repeats, you can just do them on the treadmill on an incline. But, I mean, we went into San Diego and felt good for – Ten miles. You know, two-thirds, yeah, you know, 80% of the race. And the end of the race was uh, – a incline for two straight miles it was actually straight up for two straight miles and we both bonked so hard that had we had had we had (laughs) trained properly one had we had included hill work two and had we had run more of our miles outside i don't think we would have gotten destroyed like we got destroyed i remember uh and shout out presley because there was a there was a a um kid who followed us on tiktok who came down to the race and he was talking to us after the race and I was bent over on my hands and knees talking to this guy because every time I stood up I was blacking out yeah I hit a wall we pushed ourselves there was no way we were getting that time and we did not train for it correctly there was no way we thought we could will our way to that one sub 130 no no chance 
I, I remember even us talking before the race. I was like, yeah, well, if I'm on my last two miles or I'm on my last mile, I can gut it out. Like, I don't, I, I'll like die before I get under 130. And boy, was I, I got fact checked yeah, on that got, one. We got humbled. I remember <laughs> looking at Marcus at like mile seven, like just kept looking over. We kept giving each other thumbs up. Like, we were behind the sub 130 pacers. I felt amazing. Like, I was like, there's no way I don't get this. We're on pace. Like, we were actually going faster because the Pacers were smart and they knew the hills were coming, which we <laughs> knew, but we did not know we would be as tired as we were. So we were giving thumbs up, thumbs up. You know, we get to mile, I forget exactly a mile, let's say mile 10. Mark is like, sees me falling back a little bit and he looks around. And at this point, I was like, I need to like finish the race. I'm not worried about the, the 130. Like I'm not getting it. My legs are completely jello. And you like these streets were long. So you just saw the whole you saw everybody in front of you going up. And I was like, I need to reserve some energy or else I, I'm not making it to the finish. Around this time it was demoralizing for me because like it, it was literally just Sean and I and the 130 pacer like holding a thing. There was nobody else with us at the time. And when he started dropping back is the first time in my head, in my head, I was like, shit, like, I think he's going to like drop off pace here and I'm going to have to run alone, which is even more demoralizing because it's like something you, you want to both be going through it together. So then he drops off and, um, I still feel good at this point. We haven't hit the hill. And then we take that left, <laughs> we take that left to go start, start our ascent uh, up that hill and I remember maybe a quarter mile up the hill looking at the pacer and like <laughs> I'm like how long do we how long do we have left because I didn't know what mile marker we were on and at no point did I see anybody taking right hands or left hand turns and I was I was starting to panic I was like there's no way we're going all the way to the top of this hill the hill went so far you couldn't see the top of it so you just kept covering ground and more hills started showing yeah it got to the point <laughs> where like in the beginning of the race like it, and you're going through san diego and it was awesome like it was beautiful and like people are outside cheering you on you're like giving them thumbs up and then like people were cheering me on when i was going uphill I, I i couldn't even like i felt bad because i was like these people are so nice but you're at the point where it's like you can't respond like you're just grunting and they're definitely looking at you like this kid might not finish the race dude i mean i not even talk about feeling nice i was blacking out and i honest i was asking the people lining the thing how much longer we had like i didn't know what mile i was on i had no watch my my strava was messed up so i had no idea how far we'd been running or how much longer we had the pacer guy couldn't understand what i was saying probably because i was blacking out and at this point he started to pull away from me and once he started to pull away from me i i was done there was no way i yeah, that was the worst feeling in the world. And, and then, I never want to have that happen again. Yeah. And then you get the random spectator who's like, don't worry, only like a quarter mile. And I'm like, look at my Strava. I was like, that doesn't add up. I don't think it's just a quarter mile. So you're like, is it actually a quarter mile? Should I try to push it? It's It was a mess, but it was it was really fun looking back on it. And we learned a ton. Um, oh, my God. Learning experience. And just that was like my second race ever. And that's when I was like, this is amazing. Like, how could you, how could you not love this? How could you not want to try to improve? Yeah. I mean, you, you see what happens when you don't train correctly. And now like going, we're probably overkilling the next half marathon with the way we're training right now, because if we're t quote unquote going for a one thirty, <laughs> we're more than training hard enough like we're probably training in the 125 range i don't want to jinx it so i'm not <laughs> gonna comment on that yeah but. all right well i'm gonna try to run a 122 i'm just saying <laughs> my goal is sub 130 until i get that i will recalibrate and right, figure fair. out my next goal fair um yeah i mean like uh like we said we're for the training plan if everyone wants to try to follow along it's an 11 week plan it's inside the book um, faster road racing by Pete Fitzinger. Uh, we're doing the 46, 63. I think it's schedule two and yeah, 11 weeks starts out 46 miles the first week. And then it ramps up to 63. I think that's where you peak. And then you come down a little bit before, um, the race. And then it, it has you taper before the race. Thank God. Yeah. 
and he also has, you know, the book has a bunch of other plans. It has lower mileage, higher, higher mileage, has base building plans. Um, really good book. I recommend so, it. And there's just a lot of information in the book. I, I've learned a lot about about running and like running form and how you're supposed to train. Um, so I'd recommend it and feel free to follow along. Yeah. And um, also the other thing with like fitness in general is time management prioritization. Like I think uh, especially on TikTok when I'm speaking about what I do in a day or a day in my life, people seem to get the idea that because maybe they don't enjoy fitness or they don't enjoy running that like everybody doesn't enjoy running. So this kind of stuff brings me joy because you get tan you get to see tangible progress in what you are doing on a day to day basis, you know, on, on like from day to day, you might not feel like you're making any progress, but from week 11 to race day, I know for a fact that we are going to become much faster runners by doing this 11 week plan. And so then it all, all, all it boils down to is, can we do the training every single day, barring injury? Can you show up a lot, the time needed during the day and do the training, you know? And it's really not that much. It's like at most couple hour, couple hours. And that's the longest runs on a Sunday. Like most weekday mileage is 50 minutes to an hour and a half. Yeah. And look, if you don't go and like work out and go to the gym, I, it's totally reasonable. It's, you know, if we didn't go to the gym, it would be how long I would go to the gym, like yeah. running, spent running. Um, so it's nothing crazy. We just have to do it a little earlier in the morning and then find time to lift whenever. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, another thing is, is just, if you seemingly can't find time, get up one hour and 30 minutes earlier than you normally do. I think that, yeah, I think that would apply to a lot of people. Like most, most people get up seven, eight AM, like just back, like get up an hour and a half earlier and then you can work the running into your schedule, you know, go to sleep a little bit earlier. That's all part of like, if you want to do something progressively better over time sacrifices just have to be made you know you can't just always do the things you want to do 24 7 and not have anything built into your schedule where it's like well now i have to make a sacrifice because i want to prioritize getting faster at running and so i won't stay up or i'll go to bed an hour earlier and get up an hour earlier just so i have the time to train it's one less netflix episode or something yeah and it's something I need to work on. Like Marx is good about going to bed early and waking up very early. I like to stay up late. And then if I stay up late, I struggle to wake up in the morning. So look, if I do stay up late, then I better get up in the morning. If I, you know, go to bed earlier, it won't be, it won't be as hard. Um, so I'm still, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to figure it all out. I'm still trying to master nutrition and see what, what works best for me before I run. Um, and that's the fun in it all. Just experiment as you go. Figure and out what's good for you. They, they all compound on each other, right? Like your sleep is extremely important in how you recover. And your nutrition is extremely important in how fast you are going to recover from a long run before the run the next day. And so it's constantly tweaking and trying to optimize those th three things nutrition, sleep, your performance, and ultimately what's going to work best for you and help you, you know, uh, accomplish whatever goals you may have set. You know, it could be a two hour half marathon. It could be two and a half. It could be just completing your first half marathon. The little things that you do are going to help you get there. And so, so why not explore doing them optimally? And to further that point is just we're going for a sub 130, but like any type of goal that you create for running, it's going to be just as challenging, like per, if you put it into perspective. Um, so I think that's why like the running community is so tight knit because like it doesn't matter if you're the fastest person in the world or you're the slowest person in the world, you're still going to struggle just as much as the fastest person or the slowest person in the world, which is cool because you both know you're pushing yourself hard. It doesn't make it any more or less impressive that the person is like going as fast as they are. Obviously, it's impressive, but yeah, they're I mean, still struggling. It's like everybody is pushing through their own walls, right? Like a wall for Cooper Tear 
is much different than a wall for us, but it's the same feeling for both of us is like, you have to push through that next block of this is what I need to do to get to the next level. Like continually putting yourself in uncomfortable situations to, to break through that proverbial wall. And I think, um, that, that is what leads to all runners wanting, like running community is probably one of the most helpful I think I've ever been a part of, you know, fitness community can be toxic depending on, you know, what part of the fitness community you're in. Most runners are very supportive of each other. And I think it, that all leads back to everyone's just out running for themselves essentially, you know? Yeah. I think, yeah, everybody can relate to what you're doing. Yeah. Well, I think that's the end of the episode. Um, if you are still listening, that's crazy. And if you're listening on YouTube specifically and want to drop any like um, suggestions for future episodes and or guests, whatever, just drop them in the, in the comments. Um, if you have feedback, you can always just email any of the Minted New York emails, the support email, Marcus at mintednewyork.com. Love to hear like what you think about the episodes. Other than that, I appreciate everybody who listens to this, and we should be back next week. Cheers. Cool. <clears throat> kind of crazy how fast the time goes.